Mr. Munger, by the way, I am looking forward to your book coming out. Uh, my question has to do with Doug Ivester's severance package and what justifies it, considering he had a very short tenure at, as CEO and that he took the uh, reins from some very strong performance from Consueta and to uh, be relieved of his dismal performance by Doug Daft. My brother, still in the bottling and distribution business of Coke, cut this article from Bottler's uh, World magazine concerning the severance package. He said he also would retire if he were offered this. Uh, 97.4 million in stock, 3 million per year for 2000 to 2002, 2 million per year 2002 to 2007, 1.4 million per year from 2007 for the rest of his life. Uh, anyway, I don't see how uh, car and cell phone, he gets that. That's a Mercury Grand Marquis and uh, mobile telephones, laptop, computer, and the like. I don't know why he'd need that. I've been wondering how you voted on this, whether you supported it or not, or what uh, degree considering executive pay at Berkshire hasn't risen, except perhaps for the CFO who last uh, got a raise, I believe, in 1997. You asked, uh, no, CFO's got a raise every year, but uh, the, uh, you asked whether I supported it. Yeah, I can tell you I supported it because with my 35% interest in 8% of Coca-Cola, I, I paid almost 3% of it myself, personally. I, I probably paid more severance pay than any man in the history of the world, personally. Uh, I was not on the comp committee, but I, I will say this. Doug Ivester did all kinds of, of really wonderful things for the Coca-Cola company over time. He was, he, for many, many years, when Roberto was running things, Doug and working with Don Keogh too, and you know I had this firsthand from both of them. I, I wasn't in Atlanta, but but there was no question that he was a huge, huge asset, and conceived and carried out many of the things that other people may have gotten even more credit for. Most of what you describe, not not the little things at the end, but most of what you describe, was contractually uh, in place. Uh, at the time that, that he left. I mean, those were deals that were made, restricted stock and all of that, that, that really occurred in significant part when Roberto uh, was the chief executive officer and at Roberto's recommendation. Doug's devotion to Coke, his knowledge of Coke, I mean, he lived and ate and, and breathed Coke, but in, in my opinion, Doug Daff was the man for the job and, and, and a change was made, but it was not because of any lack of attention by Doug Ivester. Uh, it was not because he hadn't done great things as CFO of the company, but uh, I think he was not the right man at, at the time uh, he took over as CEO. He took over, as you know, when Roberto died quite suddenly. Uh, there wasn't any real option in terms of the, he was Roberto's handpicked successor. Uh, I, I, it's almost inconceivable that somebody else would have been chosen at that time. And we made a decision within a couple of years that the company would move faster and better with Doug Daft in charge and we made a deal uh, in severance which uh, was about 80 percent or some very high percentage embedded and like I say I paid more of it than anybody else so it isn't it isn't like it was all academic uh, and I think considering some other factors which uh, maybe I'll put in a book sometime uh, that entered into it it was definitely the right decision for the Coca-Cola company. Whether the computer should have been included or the car or anything, I, I can't. I, I, I would not want to defend small item by small item. But I can. Uh, I think the Coca-Cola shareholders uh, uh, are going to be many billions of dollars ahead over time by by uh, what was done then, and it wasn't easy to do. We'll go to five. And Charlie, do you have anything to add on that? You paid a fair amount too. <laughs> Uh, generally speaking, I think it's a mistake for corporate America to create as much hostility as it does, which is based on the way it compensates principal officers of uh, corporations. 
it is simply maddening to add a little clause that the corporation will scratch the guy's back for you know, just tiny little bits of, of uh, stuff that looks terrible. To me, that is extremely stupid. And uh, I see it where the corporation helps him prepare his tax return for 10 years after he leaves and so forth. I think that makes a terrible impression on on shareholders generally, and I think corporate America is crazy to do it. They get sold this stuff by these damn consultants. Yeah. I, I agree with Charlie, and what it, it, it is true what Charlie says. We don't have a contract, uh, at least that I can think of, at, at Berkshire. It's perfectly easy to run a company without them. We've got wonderful managers. You know, we've got things that might be called contracts. I mean, we've got deals with them in terms of we tell them what we work out compensation arrangements and all that. We, I, I, I can't remember a case of anybody that's been with us that ever has called in a lawyer or anything of the sort, you know, or, or, the, or we, we, we even had to reduce things to writing, basically. And it works fine. And it is a little maddening, as Charlie says, to have, have uh, a CEO, you know, show up with a lawyer with a 20-page contract. I mean, it, it, it's become standard operating procedure, and once you, get, once you get a big public company with committees, consultants to the committees, consultants who usually are picked by the, by the officers of the company, they, they, they look around at what everybody else is doing and say, well, that's the way the other guy does it, so I'll do it. I think, you could, I think the proxy statements of the last 20 years, what that's induced in the way of behavior by people at, at somewhat comparable companies that look at the proxy statements of their competitors and then say to their lawyer, well, you know, Joe Blow got this, why shouldn't I have it? It just, it just escalates and escalates and escalates and it ratchets and I, I, it won't stop. I, I have never seen a compensation consultant come into a public company and suggest a plan that, that net reduces the, you know, the cost of compensation. Um, at, uh, and I see all kinds of people leave companies with, who have made tremendous amounts of money, and nobody wants to hire them at half the price, or a quarter of the price, or a tenth of the price. You know, I mean, it, it's not a market system. CEO compensation is not a market system, and it's not subject to market tests. And uh, I don't know what you do about that particularly, but I, uh, it doesn't seem to bother shareholders very much. The ones that could change well, I think it, it bothers them a lot, Warren. It's just they, they feel powerless. Yeah, but the institutional shareholders could change that. I, my guess is that the top 30 institutions probably control, uh, what, two-thirds of the big companies in the country, and, and they, don't, they don't seem to care that much. They, actually, they spend their time on, on what I regard as peripheral issues, usually. They, they, they talk about other things. They get involved in, in rituals of corporate governance that, frankly, don't mean a damn in terms of how the company performs, and they seem to ignore these other issues. But... You know, uh, we've got enough to do running Berkshire, so we, we, we can't reform the world on that. We, we will run Berkshire in a rational manner. And we have yet to hire a compensation consultant, and we've yet to lose an important manager. Mm -hmm.